welcome to episode 305 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live on October 24th, 2022. This is a show about Microsoft 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss a topic or recent news and how it relates to you. It's still Techtober, and we're continuing to fundraise for Girls Who Code. Check out the show notes for a link to help us with the fundraiser and listen to the very end of the show to find out about a super cool update to the fundraiser. Today for our topics, we try to save you a little money on Azure so you can donate to Girls Who Code by discussing Azure savings plans and how they compare to Azure reserved instances. We also discuss a recent question Scott came across on Reddit about working with file syncing and files in OneDrive. There's all kinds of things we talked about talking about. (laughs) We talk about talking about lots of things. Where do you want to start? I'll leave it to you. I'll leave it to me. Let's start with this GA feature because this one is kind of interesting. This one was intriguing and I did not see it and it came out of Ignite and you sent it over to me around saving plans in Azure. Yes, let's talk about savings plans briefly. I think to talk about savings plans, we need to take a step back and talk about reservations, uh, specifically in the context of compute. So we're going to talk about savings plans. Savings plans are technically savings plans for compute, and they're kind of related, but not really not really the same as reserved instances or reservations for compute services as well. So just real quick, reservations for compute would be you are a customer who has some level of ongoing spend in a given compute service, and that's usually going to be in a specific SKU in a specific region. So maybe today you kind of sit down and, and you look at your Azure estate, you say, okay, I'm running a bunch of DS4 VMs in East US 2, and you know these things are on 24-7, or even if they're not on 24-7, you use them enough to know that they're basically something that you're always going to use, and you're going to be locked into them for some period of time that you're willing to commit to. And that commitment would be in the form of a one or three year reservation. So you would say like, okay, I know for the next year that I need 20 DSV4s in East US 2. So you would go out and buy a reservation for that. And that reservation is effectively a pre-commitment to saying like, hey, not only are you going to always be billed for these things, whether you use them or not, I think that's an important part of the commitment. You're going to say, I'm going to be running these things for this period of time in this region, but Microsoft is going to give you a discount for that. And that discount varies based on the region, the type of compute you're selecting, and the length of the term, whether it's a a one or three year term on top of it, with the three year term coming with a bigger discount on top of it most of the time. And you can do this for things like virtual machines. So that could be like one off VMs that you're doing, could be a certain VM family series size that you use within your VM scale sets for your deployments. There's other type of types of compute services out there. So there might be things like Azure Dead dedicated host. You could be using something like App Service Premium and kind of the dedicated, I, I think like the isolated instances of App Service have a, have a similar concept for reservations when it comes to reserve compute. Things like containers come with that, like AKS runs on VMs, so you might just go and do reservations for the, you know, for the, the VM hosts that you run up and, and run things that way. So in general, they work pretty good. If you know exactly what you need and you know the region that you need it in. And if you're aligned on that, that's a pretty you know straightforward way to go. One of the things yep. I think lots of customers run into is they don't always know the region they're going to be in. You might start in something like East US one day, and then you go, ooh, you know, I really want to be in East US 2 because that has more preferential pricing for my VM series or something like that. And now you've got this reservation that you bought yourself for East US and you have to trade it back in. It's prorated. You can only trade them in so often. And there can be a little bit of inflexibility there. You also have to kind of, because these reservations are tied to 
not only SKUs, but also regions, you have to go out and buy them every time you go into a new region. So maybe you start today and, and you know, you're a new company and you're starting in East US and then you go, okay, like we've grown in the US, we're ready to expand to Europe. Great. Now I got to go figure out where I'm going to buy my reservations next. Is that going to be in North Europe? Is that going to be in West Europe? What am I going to do? How do I rationalize that? What does that look like? And now that kind of lack of flexibility with reservations potentially starts to hurt a little bit along the way, right? There, it doesn't hurt. There's just there's friction there and you have to figure out what's going on and, and rationalize that as a customer. So this is kind of where savings plans come in. So savings plans are like reservations in that you are committing to a certain amount of spend in compute services. So you're saying like, hey, for virtual machines, I spend, you know, again, $1,000 a month every single month. And I'd like a little bit of a discount on that. Like, you know, if I have the opportunity to not pay pay go rates, then that could be preferential for me. So what you can do is you can buy this thing called a savings plan. And when you buy a savings plan, it's super simple. You go in and you set a scope for the savings plan, kind of like you would have the scope for reservations as well. So it could be something like a, could be a subscription scope. It could be a management group scope. It could be a resource group scope. It could also be some shared scope, like depending on the type of uh, billing agreement that you're under. So it, it kind of differs if you're an enterprise agreement customer, your billing scope could be your overall enrollment. Like that could be a shared scope for you. If you're an MCA customer, like you're on the newer uh, Microsoft customer agreements, the billing scope could be your billing profile. And if you're on a partner agreement, your billing scope would be a customer underneath that. So you can kind of set the level at which this savings plans apply. So you pick the level. So I would go in and I would say, you know what, I have this subscription for my product that I sell, right? Like we, 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 we resell something to customers. We're just going to go ahead and say all that stuff lives in the same subscription. So I want this discount in my production environment. I've got a, a subscription for prod. So you go and you buy the savings plan. You say, okay, I'm going to scope it to this subscription. You're going to then select the amount that you want to commit to for compute services. So you'll say $1,000 is the amount that you're going to commit to. And then you click save. (laughs) And that's it. You didn't select a VM. You didn't select a compute service. You didn't say like, hey, I want this for container instances, or I want this for premium functions, or I want this for dedicated host, or I want this for my AVD pools, anything like that. All you did was select a scope and a commitment amount, and you click save. And that's it. You're off and and running at that point. The savings plan kind of takes hold almost immediately. And then any of your hourly spend on qualified compute services up to the amount that you put into your savings plan. So in this case, we said $1,000. So all your spend in the month up to $1,000 in that eligible compute that you're running gets that discount that comes from the savings plan. Once you cross the threshold, very much like it is in reservations land, you cross the threshold, you just start paying the pay-go rate from there. So you get a you get a discount that's kind of part of the way to reservations, but not all the way. So I think in some of like the regions I was looking at for some certain types of VMs, you would get, say, like a you might get like a 23, 24% discount on a three-year commitment under a savings plan versus a three-year commitment in RIs, which would give you a 26, 27% discount, something like that. It can give you more flexibility. If you don't have that rigor in planning, you think you're going to need more flexibility and kind of growth, and you don't want to be locked into the regional plan. 
or that kind of the regional lock-in that comes with something like a reservation. There is some flexibility here. So you can take reservations. You can trade those reservations back in for the prorated amount that's kind of left on the rest of the reservation. Uh, You can then convert those into savings plans if you want to. There's a comment in the chat that this is for smaller companies. I think this would certainly help smaller companies, like just straight up, everyone should probably go take a look at this. If the units of compute that you use are eligible for this and you're in a type of subscription that's eligible, like I think locking it into MCAs and enterprise agreements, mm, you know, I think small company and I guess it depends on our version of SMB and, and that. I think there's still a lot of companies out there that potentially are smaller that aren't locked into an MCA. So they wouldn't have this eligibility there. Like you can't go into a Paygo account or a Paygo subscription and then be able to spin up savings plans along the way. But, you know, if you are eligible for them, they're out there, they're available for use. Uh, You can also mix and match them with reservations, which I think is going to be super interesting to kind of all companies that are eligible for this, not just small companies. You know, if you have a new team that's coming in, like you're developing a new service and, or, you know, a new application and, and you don't know what it's going to look like at the end of the day, like you don't know what kind of VMs it's going to land in. You don't know if it's going to be using something like premium functions, or is it going to be stood up on VM scale sets, or is it going to be running in AKS and, and kind of the compute that comes along with that? If you don't know, you can still go ahead and buy a savings plan and still be eligible for that discount up to the amount that it's available for. And then over time, you grow into it, you start to lock it in, you get a kind of a a more defined vision of what your service is going to be or what that application is going to be. And then maybe you move into RIs at that point for the locked in discount that comes with those, or I guess the greater discount that comes with those be a more fair way to say it. So when you do savings plans, I was looking through some of this and reading through it. You're essentially prepaying. So we use the example of $1,000. You're putting $1,000 into your savings plan, essentially. And as you run these different things, it's getting deducted from that prepayment at that discounted rate Correct. over the course of a month. So I do have one question. Like You can pay monthly or yearly, right? Is this always committing to a monthly? So let's say I do a prepaid for a year. We used $1,000 a month as an example. I prepay $12,000. If I run over it the first month and then stay under it the second month, is it still locked into that $1,000 a month? It's just when I choose to pay versus having like a bucket of $12,000 I can pull from. Correct. Yeah. It, it, my understanding of it and, and from everything I've seen so far, it's it's at that the monthly billing cycle that still occurs there. There's no difference in discount versus whether you choose to pay up front or pay monthly. So, you know, say, say, you know, that thousand dollars gave you a 17% discount. It may, yep. it's 17% whether you choose to pay that thousand dollars a month or whether you choose to pay $12,000 up front, whatever it is. It's really just when your company prefers to make that Correct. payment for budgetary reasons yep. or for, yeah. So you get that flexibility that comes along with it. Yeah, I like the flexibility because like you said, I have some clients that buy reserved instances, but they are, they're locked into a specific VM size and a specific region and all of that. So they can't even change the size of their VMs. And for that reason, they tend to do a year. They're running VMs 24 seven they know the sizes, they've been running them at this size for two or three years, and they're like, you know what, we can buy reserved instances, but if they did ever want to scale up or scale down, they can't use that reserved instance as they scale. So there's definitely a lot of benefits I see to these savings plans. It's also nice that you can scope these down. Like you said, you can do it at the management group level. It looks like you can even go down to a savings plan for a specific resource group. Yep. Yeah, so if you have that team out there that's doing some type of, like like I said, like dev for a new app and they don't know what they don't know yet, and you yep. want them to be able to grow into it over time, like, you know, why not just take that discount and have the flexibility there? Like, if you're running the compute, 
you'll use it probably somewhere along the way. If it's something that you feel like you need, like, hey, it's totally out there. I think like it's a great model to not lock you into things like a region or a specific series of VM or things like that. Like I run into customers a lot who potentially do something like they start with like a general purpose compute and they run with that for, you know, six months or a year. And then they learn like, okay, here's a new thing that's out here. Like I, I want to go from like the D series to the L series because it's optimized for something really great around my application. And now it's like they got to go trade it back in. They've, they've got to do like the whole, you know, rigmarole that comes with that and figure it out. And then how much the L series do I need? Like what's going on there? Like, well, crap, yep. now I was a year into that other thing. Do I purchase just a year now or do I do, you know, another three year thing? And, and what's my horizon? So this is way easier because it's just a number and then it applies to everything at that scope. So virtual machines, dedicated hosts, container instances, premium functions, and then those isolated app services. Like just go yep. run, run them all you want. Exactly. Yeah. I've even seen people have to move VMs to a different region because something like availability zones yep. or something like that isn't supported in a region. They don't think about it. Maybe they don't think they need it when they first start out six months in. Shoot, we have to go move these to another region to get some supported feature that isn't in the region we initially stood up in. So, yes. It'll be interesting to see too if they roll this out to more services as they continue to use it, if this catches on, if they'll start including more and more of those Azure services in here. I think over time, you'll probably see it come to more compute services. <laughs> and, I, and I keep harping on compute because I think that's really what it is. This is a savings plan for compute. It's not just an all up savings plan. Like I work in storage and we have reservations over in storage, but those are not compute reservations. Those are capacity reservations. They're a totally different class of things. Or you have PaaS-ish services, like maybe like a Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB has reservations as well. But then you're buying by DTUs and these other things. So this is really like compute services that have these fixed hourly costs that are associated with them. I think it's also important to call out these are just for the hourly costs of the compute. So if you have additional licensing costs on top of there, so maybe like a Windows VM or SQL, things like that, the savings plan doesn't apply to software. It's specifically applicable to the underlying compute costs. So you might have to think about like, like a hub, like the Azure hybrid benefit or, or things like that, and, and make sure that you're lined up there. And also with that, don't overbuy on your savings plans because if you're looking at a VM cost and you don't differentiate the software cost versus the VM cost, a lot of those, like your cost is cut in half yes. with the hybrid benefit. <laughs> so don't go buy a thousand dollars in savings plans. Thinking or with the software inadvertently included in there, because you may really only need five hundred dollars of savings plans, and then figure out another five hundred for your Windows licenses. Yeah, you might also want to look like if you're doing reservations today, and you go like, "Oh, this might be interesting to me." There are some reservations that aren't eligible to be traded in for savings plans. So there's compute services out there, say like Databricks or Synapse, things like that. There's a couple of Rel plans like uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, things like that, those aren't eligible to be traded in for savings plans. You could trade them in, but then you could be kind of in a rut because now you just traded it in, but you can't do the <laughs> the savings plan and you know recoup some of that cost there, some of those savings there, I guess. So yeah, just keep that in the back of your head as well. So if you are an, a customer who's on an EA, so you're an enterprise agreement, a, a Microsoft customer agreement, an MCA, or an MPA, a Microsoft partner agreement, uh, might be something that you potentially want to go look at. Absolutely. If I didn't have Azure credits that I used for most of my stuff, like I have a couple of VMs that I leave running most of the time, like a domain controller, that happens to fit within some of my credits. This is definitely something I would go look at. Do you feel overwhelmed by trying to manage your Office 365 environment? Are you facing unexpected issues that disrupt your company's productivity? Intelligent is here to help. Much like you take your car to the mechanic that has specialized knowledge on how to best keep your car running, 
Intelligent helps you with your Microsoft Cloud environment because that's their expertise. Intelligent keeps up with the latest updates in the Microsoft Cloud to help keep your business running smoothly and ahead of the curve. Whether you are a small organization with just a few users up to an organization of several thousand employees, they want to partner with you to implement and administer your Microsoft Cloud technology. Visit them at intellijink.com slash podcast. That's I-N-T-E-L-L-I-G-I-N-K dot com slash podcast for more information or to schedule a 30-minute call to get started with them today. Remember, Intellijink focuses on the Microsoft Cloud so you can focus on your business. So, Scott, should we move on to a new topic? Let's do it. It's your show. I just sit here and I participate. No, it is not my show. I don't know that I want to bite off what I've been dealing with, given the time and what we've been talking, or how long we've been talking about service plans. Do you have another news article, or do you want to go have some fun and talk about one of these other articles you sent over to me? You get to pick that. Let's have some fun. And let's give you a chance to participate a little bit here. I participate in a couple of (laughs) Reddit forums and kind of roll them all up into a big multi-Reddit I can follow along with for, you know, across Azure, Office 365, things like that. It's really interesting to, I think, to see the types of questions that folks ask over there. Like, I troll around, like, the Azure subreddit just to see what kind of things people are running into with storage. Like, hey, can I go improve some documentation around that? Things like that. So one that I ran across the other day was about OneDrive and somebody looking for some guidance there. And I think like this is just, it, it's kind of indicative of the things that folks in the quote unquote like real world run into, right? And, and just where they kind of ask questions. So just to frame this out, this is a post in the Office 365 subreddit. And it's, I, I think, an end user coming in and asking a question about OneDrive and and kind of how they're using it. So our finance department uses a shared OneDrive folder called Finance. This Finance folder has about 60,000 folders within it, each of which have multiple subfolders within subfolders for different groups, current and prior years, etc. The current size of the Finance folder is 40.3 megabytes. This made me laugh. So this is a large folder. I'd be willing to bet this is somebody who had this thing like synced up through the OneDrive client and they're just looking at it and it's actually like set to like cloud only files and all the data is not there. But yeah, sorry, 40 megs is like one Word document or one Excel file. It's not 60,000 folders and all the subfolders and things that come along with it. I thought even if you had offline though, it still showed you the actual size of the files and not the size of essentially the sim links. I can't remember. Well, maybe we can translate MB to GB. To gigabytes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that might be a better way to think about it, right? But I mean, not everybody understands the size of files and folders, base 10, base 2, all, the, all that yeah. kind of stuff that comes into Windows. So that's all good and all fine. But anyway, this person personally works in two main folders within inside that finance folder. And inside those two folders, there's some more subfolders that also contain some more subfolders. Again, back to that current and prior year thing, you know, each quarter, each month. They really only need to work out of one folder, but they really need to be up to date as others need to review their work or they need to pull data from others as they complete their files. So they've got coworkers that are in any one, any number of these 60,000 other folders, and they're having issues with time delays between syncing from File Explorer as compared to when others can see their updates in their own File Explorer. Some people have issues, some don't. So long story short, this person is forced to work only via OneDrive online so they can make sure that others are seeing the most up-to-date files and they can see that others are the most up-to-date as well. And they're really frustrated by having to always work out of OneDrive online, what they call OneDrive online. What do you tell them, Ben? How do you get them to solve this problem? Okay, so the very first thing... I'm going to harp on Microsoft a little bit here for their naming of stuff. <laughs> Again? My you just did this first last question. <laughs> I did. And I'm not, it's not even going to be the Office 365 versus Microsoft 365 this time. I am going to... My very first question when somebody comes to me like this is, show me what your OneDrive is. Because... And 
this is another one of those conversations, just like last week, where I have this all the time, is are you talking about a OneDrive for business folder? Is this a OneDrive online in the browser? And that's where all these are. Is somebody's personal OneDrive for business storage space? Or is this a SharePoint site for finance? And when you refer to OneDrive, you're referring to your OneDrive client that's synchronizing files down. I can't quite tell from this is which of those this is. It almost seems like they're referring more to the client itself. And it could possibly be using the SharePoint site, but I'm not 100% sure. So that would be the first route I would go down with this is, okay, we've got to figure out where these files actually are and put them in an appropriate place. Because if this is the entire finance department using a folder in some personal person's OneDrive, you're going to have a really bad day when that one person (laughs) quits and OneDrive gets deleted with all 60,000 folders with subfolders upon subfolders upon files upon files upon files. That would be the first thing I would look at with this. The second thing is... In there's some comments in here since you sent it to me the other day, and somebody mentioned this in here, and I have seen this issue myself, is when you start talking about 60,000 folders, let's say each of those 60,000 folders, within that's some subfolders. Let's say an average of five subfolders for every 60 folders. You're already at... 30,000 folders, then you have files and files upon that. I mean, you're talking hundreds of thousands of files at this point in time. One of the limits with your OneDrive sync client is 300,000 items. And this is going to include folders. And I have seen this several times before where if you're trying to sync over 30,000 items, you're just going to have a really bad day every single day. Companies have been able to get to 300,000. I would say typically you start running into issues a lot lower, like about half of that, 150, 200,000, where syncing, in theory, can take several hours to keep up to date because you start thinking about just what your OneDrive client is doing. It's trying to keep track of 300,000 items. And if you have multiple people changing those, all of these different services have to keep track of who's changing which files in which order. And synchronizing those deltas to all these different machines, it just takes time. There's no way around it. (laughs) That would be the other thing I would talk about is let's sync these appropriately. And they say they only need a certain quarter each month, yearly. I would dive into what are the size of those and teach them how you can actually go in and synchronize on a folder level and not necessarily on the entire library level. That's the ticket, right? Like you start to just dial down and get lower and lower and lower. And I've done this in like, even in like the environment I work in today, I have to do this in some places. Like I have to be very kind of selective in the subfolders that I sync rather than just syncing up the entire library or trying to do like selective sync on a folder by folder basis or things like that. Like it just breaks down way too fast. Yep. And I have some clients that I've worked with with this. They're, they're like, I need to sync my, synchronize my files. I have this. We have a massive library. Again, the 60,000 folders in a single, if this is truly a document library with 60,000 folders, even if they're running half a million, a million items in a library. That's still supported. You can go up to 30 million items in a library. No problem with that. But you definitely need a selectively sync. And I do this myself. I've worked with some clients on this. Not just going down to the individual folder level, but I am actually fiddling with my sync settings quite a bit when it comes to syncing document libraries and stuff from my SharePoint sites. Maybe I'm working on a project, I'm working with a bunch of files for whatever reason. It's easier to have those files synchronized down. I synchronize them down to my computer, work on them. When I'm done with that project or done with those files, I unsynchronize it and I go synchronize the next one I'm working with. So there's not really a big issue with changing what you're synchronizing based on your use case, what you're working on. All of that type of stuff. That's another one I would look at. And then they do talk some about it would be nice to not have to open files from online, 
open them from Windows Explorer or File Explorer. That's another one of those where I tend to ask why. Why do you actually need to open them from Windows Explorer or your File Explorer, Finder, whatever OS you're using versus opening them right from the browser? Having OneDrive, having SharePoint up on your browser and opening the file, to me, is not that big of a deal. Granted, I do have faster internet, but it doesn't seem to be any longer really opening them from the browser versus File Explorer. So that's the other thing I always dive into is if you want to use a a typical file share environment, don't use SharePoint. Or if you're using SharePoint, don't think of it as a typical file share because you're synchronizing, you're not opening files from a central repository and open them online when you need to. Unless you're dealing with movie files or you're working with a bunch of images in Photoshop, some of the ones I synchronize are when I actually store PowerShell scripts in a SharePoint site and I want to be able to edit PowerShell scripts and Visual Studio. But if you're just working with Word, Excel, PowerPoint, PDF, text files, just open them from the browser. It'll frankly make everybody's lives easier. It'll save resources on your computer. Use SharePoint like it was intended to be used. Don't try to force it into a file explorer scenario. And I think that's something we've even talked about before on a few previous episodes when we compared all these different file storage scenarios and when to use what and all of that. Yeah, some of it's interesting, like user adoption kinds of things. I remember going through this in a past org I was at where we were making the conversion from on-prem file shares over to things like SharePoint Online and and kind of going through that whole, hey, let's go on-prem to SPO. And what are the user behaviors that you need to drive that are potentially different there? So one of the things I noticed that this person wrote is it sounds like some people are doing things like just copying and pasting files back into the shared folders, which is totally a user behavior thing. Like I know, you know, particularly with like finance, HR, like you get into these complicated spreadsheets. And so what people do is they go to the file share and then they copy it locally. They do all their work there and then they just go and paste it back in. So you lose that benefit of kind of real-time collaboration that's built into things like the clients. Like I'm not so hung up on saying don't use the file explorer. If you want to use Excel, go ahead and use Excel. I would bet for a financial spreadsheet, many cases you actually have to use Excel. Like it's just going to be complicated enough that it's going to require that. But when you open that thing up in Excel, open it up in an Excel client that actually works with Office 365 and SharePoint Online and is going to have things like real-time collab and you know co-authoring capabilities within it. Like and then train people like, "Hey, don't go to this folder and copy it out and move it over to your desktop and work on it and then copy it back later. Just work on it in place." Like like the world of like, "Hey, copy it over here, rename it to underscore v1, underscore v2, underscore v36000." Like you don't need to do that anymore. Just go ahead, double click it, open it up in Excel. Excel will throw up a little thing. It'll say, hey, I'm still syncing. Wait until it says it's done syncing and then you should be good. Yeah, I agree in that. More often than not, when people are experiencing OneDrive and SharePoint issues, it's what you said. It's a user training issue and a user behavior issue. I get it. There are limitations. You can't sync more than 300,000 files. If you're trying to sync down... 200 gigs of documents, you might run into issues. But frankly, you're probably going to run into issues with anything you use if you're throwing that much data across your internet connection, all of that. A lot of times it's just, there are certain limitations. You do need to work around them. You need to be aware of them and you have to work on that user behavior based on those. If you don't like them, go find something else. (laughs) There you go. I am very compassionate there. How's that? <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, you're definitely feeling empathy for those end users. I got you. Yeah. So no, that's where I would start with that. But yeah, that was interesting. We might have to start doing this more, Scott, pulling out random questions from Reddit threads or articles we find online and just discussing our takes on them. Uh, you know, 
sky's the limit. We we can do anything there. So I think we're almost at time. So you know what else we can do? Yes. We can talk about fundraising for Girls Who Code once again. So for those that are still listening, it is still Techtober and we've still got this going on. I started to see some donations roll in, which is awesome and very well and very good. I think that we can sweeten the pot a little bit. Like I'm not above bribing people to get them to donate money <laughs> to a good cause. Here's what we're going to do. We have a couple of NFC Yubi keys to give away. So we've talked a bunch. Nobody can see your video. I can see your video. Nobody but- can see yours, but you can. I didn't know if you remembered what they uh, were. Yeah, so, so these are uh, Yubi Key 5Cs, NFC edition. So we've got a couple of these to go ahead and give away. And we've been talking a bunch about how you can use, you know, UB keys for MFA, secure authentication, things like that. So if you've been looking to get hands on with them, here's here's a really good opportunity for you. So what we're going to do is for everybody who gives a donation of $5 or more, and I'll kind of be super flexible here, like $5 in, you know, effectively like your local currency kind of thing, right? So if I donate $5 US or you're in Australia and you donate $5, you're good. You don't have to match it to US currency, anything like that. So for anybody who donates $5 or more, for every $5 you donate, you will go ahead and get one entry for a YubiKey. So all you need to do is email us at giveaways at msclouditpro.com. Just give us a confirmation. Like we just need to see how much you donated and we need to know what your email address is so we can kind of track how many entries you have and put you in a little spreadsheet sheet. So when we get to the end of the month here, about mid-November-ish probably, we'll do a little drawing and we'll give away two YubiKeys for the folks who have the most entries. So I saw that a couple of people already made some donations. I saw some $50 ones out there. I saw $100 ones. So if you've already made a donation, go ahead and send us an email. Let us know what you donated and, and, and a good email address to get a hold of you if you want to be entered in here. And we'll go ahead and get those going and start tracking them. And uh, hopefully, yeah, some folks get to walk away with some YubiKeys at the end of the month here. Yes, absolutely. I like it, Scott. I like that plan. Do I get to win if I donate? No, you don't get to win. You and I already... Hosts are... We already bought our YubiKeys, so... Hosts are excluded (laughs) from this particular competition. That's it. Uh, hopes are excluded, but everybody else is eligible. You know, if you're a listener, if you've been a guest in the past, like whatever it is, I'm not going to post this email address or anything to the show notes. So you have to listen to kind of get this far in and, and hear it and participate. Yes, definitely. Awesome. Well, thanks, Scott. Sounds like a plan. Yep. And with that, we'll wrap it up for today. All right. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thanks, Scott. We'll talk to you later. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.